After months of speculation, investigation, and plenty of smuggled images and leaks, we finally know the cause of the next major global conflict. In 2042, after decades of escalating natural disasters, energy shortages, and economic collapses, the United States and Russia, the world's last two superpowers, are fighting over the few resources that remain. Now previously, the Templin Institute pitched a few ideas of what we'd like to see in the next world war, so to speak. And the alternate reality of 2042 is notable for being nowhere on that list. Still, I think this has the potential to be an interesting alternate reality, even if large parts of it seem kind of strange. And so, on this episode of Incoming, I'd like to take a brief look and give my thoughts on the world of Battlefield 2042. Details at this moment are still sparse, but we do have some revealing insights into the state of the world. The first of these is that in 2033, a major hurricane, the world's first Category 6 storm, did… something. The impact of this storm remains nebulous, but judging from some of the architecture in the cities of this future, it looks like this was the prelude to rising sea levels and unpredictable extreme weather. The Earth's deteriorating environment causes global fuel and food shortages, sparking a second Great Depression. And in 2035, the European Union officially disbands following the collapse of Germany. This is an especially interesting detail because it provides solid evidence, or at least makes it very likely, that this universe takes place in a different timeline from the one in which the European Union and Pan-Asian Coalition are fighting to escape a new Ice Age. So far this all seems to make sense, more or less, but this is where things get a little strange. No Pats, or the non-patriated, seem to be a big part of this future world. The idea behind No Pats is that all those displaced by this ongoing societal collapse band together into ragtag refugee fleets and convoys. They are described as, quote, Families, doctors, engineers, and soldiers, the once privileged and the impoverished, with backgrounds that are worlds apart, forced together, determined to survive. By 2037, there are roughly 1.2 billion no-pats, and while the worst effects of the disasters of the previous years have been mitigated, there's no easy way to repatriate all these people. Quite a lot of them have become distrustful of the government that exiled them, and they've created a new sense of identity. Hashtag we are no pats becomes a rallying cry. Now in the midst of all this, tensions rise once again between the United States and Russia. Apparently both are vying for a place of dominance within the new geopolitical landscape. In 2040, a sudden space debris storm creates a Kessler effect, causing 70% plus of all orbiting satellites to malfunction and crash to Earth. International distrust surges overnight. No one can spy on each other, so no one can trust each other. Both Russia and the US claim the other is responsible for the blackout, while some suspect no pats are behind it and accuse them of trying to sow anarchy. With war imminent, both the United States and Russia decide to leverage groups of no pats as proxy soldiers. To maintain plausible deniability, both sides field no pat tax forces as proxies in escalating conflicts over resources, promising the refugees a piece of what's left. Open war is imminent, no pats have no choice but to choose sides, fighting not for a flag, but for their future. There are some cool ideas here. Escalating environmental calamities, society thrown into chaos, a sudden technological disaster, rendering global communications and intelligence gathering near useless. These are the things that would make a world war much more likely and believable, and I am always a fan of believability. But I'm also a little turned off here. One of the reasons I like the Cold War so much is that depending on the era, both sides are at the top of their game. NATO and the Warsaw Pact have worldwide influence, both have ideologies competing for the soul of mankind, and everyone is just waiting for that spark to ignite. To use a boxing metaphor, well actually I don't know anything about boxing, but this is like the big boxing match, whatever the biggest event is called. But in 2042, both the United States and Russia have suffered for decades, and much of their infrastructure and institutions are crippled. While unstable governments like these are much more likely to go to war, it does mean that instead of two heavyweight fighters in the prime of their careers going at it, you have a couple of sick and tired geriatrics, on their last legs, feebly jabbing each other with the last ounce of their strength. 
This type of scenario, in my opinion at least, is maybe more believable, but not as interesting. There's a few other details that stick out to me. The Templin Institute's own space program is just getting going, so I don't know a whole lot about satellites, but I'm not sure I believe a debris storm could take out 70% of all satellites. Aren't they located in all sorts of different orbiting distances, from geostationary to medium Earth orbit? Maybe only that latter group survived, and this actually all makes sense, but whenever I see a percentage tossed around like that, it always feels like it was chosen kind of arbitrarily. I'm also not entirely sure why, just because a large part of the satellite grid is down, the internet, communications, navigation, surveillance, and storm forecasts would no longer be possible. In the modern world, satellites are certainly a big part of these things, but there are multiple aspects to them. There's still oceanic cables linking parts of the world together, there's still spy planes, and from what I understand, a large part of weather tracking is still done on the ground. I mean, surely there are ways to predict tornadoes without having a satellite in space. So while all these elements seem a bit uneven to me, the whole non-patriated, no-pat thing falls completely flat. For what is apparently a large focus of the world, a permanent fixture in economic, military, and social policy making, I still don't really get what they are, there's not a whole ton of details. From their brief description, they almost sound like a group of nomads who wouldn't be out of place in the post-apocalyptic wastelands of Australia. But with 1.2 billion of them, that can't be right. How do they get their water, food, the basic supplies you need to live? And where are they exactly? Are they concentrated in what today we would consider the third world? Are there instead scattered pockets of them all over the place, including first world and second world countries? What do they even want? Do they all want the same thing? It's mentioned that no pats were both abandoned, but then also exiled. They want to return home, but they also refuse to reassimilate. This all seems very convoluted and all over the place. And it's okay for there to be division within a large group like this, but they're written of as if they all belong to the same broad social movement. And the idea that the United States and Russia would hire NOPAT groups to use as proxy forces seems pretty absurd. This kind of approach sometimes works when you're dealing with smaller scale or more regional conflicts, but with the fate of humanity seemingly hanging in the balance, maybe mobilize those giant military industrial complexes you spent all that money on, rather than arming some radicals you have really no control over, who are just wandering around with nothing but an anti-government attitude, and a lame Twitter hashtag. The explanation that these forces are being used by either side as a way to maintain plausible deniability is also counterproductive when you put it in the wider context of the world. If both sides are fighting over resources, things I imagine like mineral deposits or oil fields or arable land, the whole point would be to lay claim to it, right? Where is the sense in launching a military operation to claim something you desperately need, only to deny that you claimed it? In a world like this, where everything is up for grabs, it feels like there'd be some value in just coming out and saying, Russia has taken the Baku oil fields. Plausible deniability has its place in covert operations, but when you have entire combined arms formations of NOPATs going around the world seizing territory, you're kind of past the point of plausible deniability. The scale of the conflict just seems so huge that it would be impossible to deny the involvement of either side, even if NOPATs are doing much of the fighting. If a few rebels ambushed a convoy somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I can see the US getting away with claiming, yeah, we weren't involved in that. That was those NOPATs again, you know them. But an amphibious assault on a space launch complex in French Guiana, a blitzkrieg into one of the largest cities of South Korea, these aren't things you can just throw together. If Russia brings this up at the next Security Council meeting, is anyone gonna believe the United States when they say, Oh yeah, we have no idea how those NOPATs got their hands on F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and our new modernized Abrams tanks. And isn't it just so crazy they also had the fuel and the spare parts and the logistic networks and support personnel needed to keep them all up and running? And that all the NOPATs involved somehow just knew how to work all this modern military equipment? Yeah, someone's really gonna have to look into how all those NOPATs managed to invade Singapore, but the US had nothing to do with it. Can you really see Russia coming back and saying, well, we'd like to prove otherwise, but your deniability is just too plausible? Although, it might be in Russia's best interest to simply come back and say, well, if America wasn't involved, that means we have a rogue state capturing Singapore, so we're gonna send in peacekeepers, and if anyone tries to stop us, they're in violation of international law. 
Now, granted, maybe in 2042 there is no UN Security Council or even a nation of Singapore, but this whole method of fighting war through NOPATs just seems needlessly complex and self-defeating. And why would the NOPATs agree to this arrangement in the first place? It's mentioned that they refuse to reassimilate and don't trust the government, but then a bunch of them decide to become proxy soldiers on the promise they'll be reassimilated. Going back to that earlier quote, it's mentioned that the NOPATs have to choose sides. But do they though? And if both Russia and the United States are using NOPATs, then the NOPATs are just fighting amongst themselves, which seems to contradict that whole idea of unity their community is based on. But it's the line, no pats are fighting not for a flag, but for their future, that stands out to me, and I think reveals a fundamental misunderstanding of why wars are fought. That quote seems to infer that flags and the future are somehow separate, but they're actually inexorably linked. Nobody is fighting for a flag because they're a big fan of cotton rectangles. They're fighting because of what that flag represents, their duty, their nation, and ultimately the belief in a better world. Flags and ideologies promise that future, and they have been a pivotal foundation of human society across all of history. And in a world like the one we see in 2042, I think the powers of ideology and flags would have only deepened. Displaced, betrayed people like the Nopats would, in my opinion, become driven almost purely by ideology, because what else do they have? It might be hard to distill my central point here, but I think it's that nationalism, politics, and ideologies are at the core of every major conflict. Control over resources and territory is usually a symptom, not the cause. To have these elements ripped out of a future global war and replaced with vague references to rising tensions, Twitter hashtags, and inclement weather doesn't interest me as much. Now, when analyzing alternate worlds, I sometimes like to swing the sword of judgment and declare whether a world works or it doesn't work. For Battlefield 2042, I'm inclined to say the latter, but I also have to accept that in a world where a pilot can jump out of his F-35, shoot down an Su-57 with a rocket launcher, and then get back into his cockpit, maybe the geopolitics can get away with being similarly absurd better to let all this just fade into the background and enjoy shooting stuff. But that, of course, is just my opinion. And even though I and I alone have risen through the chaos of the world within an isolated bastion of perfect arguments, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What do you make of the world of Battlefield 2042? Does it work? Does it not? Do you want to be able to pet that robot dog? Let me know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been Incoming. In Incoming, the Templin Institute discusses the theories and ideas found across alternate worlds. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to join the Templin Institute, consider pledging to our Patreon page. Along with increased security access, you'll be able to vote in polls to determine future topics, get custom wallpaper every week, and receive some other exclusive rewards.